Shabbat Shalom and welcome to Beth Zion Messianic Synagogue in Jackson, New Jersey. I'm Rabbi Jan Rosenberg and this is Shabbat Online, our special online Shabbat service. We're glad you decided to join us today for this time of worship and the Word. I hope everything is going well with you in your home uh, during this unusual time in our history. And uh, we're glad that you're here and we appreciate so much your being involved and choosing to spend this time with us on this Shabbat morning. Let's draw near to the Lord and bless His name together. Baruch Hu Ed Adonai HaMevorach Baruch Adonai HaMevorach Le'olam Va'ed Blessed be the Lord who is blessed. Blessed be the Lord who is blessed forever and ever. Amen. We continue with the prayer of the Vishamru. Hashem said to Moshe, Tell the people of Israel you are to observe my Shabbats, for this is a sign between me and you through all your generations, so that you will know that I am Hashem who sets you apart from me. Therefore, you are to keep my Shabbat, because it is set apart for you. And of course, when we say Hashem, it refers to the name and refers to the covenantal name of God, the Lord, our Creator. Vishamru bene Yisrael et hashabat la sotet hashabat le dor tamberit olam bene uven bene Yisrael od hi le olam ki sheshet yam in asadonai. Et Hashemayim v'yeroretz Uvayom Hashvi Shavad v'yinofash And the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, observing the Shabbat throughout their generations as an everlasting covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever that in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and on the seventh day he ceased from work and rested. God is wanting so much to give us Shabbat as a place of rest, to experience his blessing as we mentioned in Shemot in Exodus 31 in the passage that we read. God says that this is a sign between me and you through all our generations so that we can know him and be set apart for him. And he gives us Shabbat so that we can experience it being set apart for us, so we can draw near to Him. We continue with the Shema. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Baruch Shem Kivod Malchuto, Le'olam va'ed. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be His name, whose glorious kingdom is forever. Amen. And when Messiah was asked the question, Rabbi, what is the most important command? He answered with the words of the Shema and said the following, Ve'ahavta et Adonai Elohecha, Bechol avavachol, uvechol nafshecha, uvechol meldecha, v'hayu hadvarim ha'ele, asher anochim etzavacha hayom alavavecha, v'shinam tam levanecha, v'dibarta bam, v'shiftecha b'veitecha, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up, you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them upon the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. 
Messiah then said, The second command is like unto the first, V'yahavta l'recha kamocha, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well, here we are, once again, coming together on Shabbat through the internet. And we are so glad you're here. I mentioned that before, but I really am. I'm, I'm in my office by myself, but I know that you're listening at the other end. And I hope this is going to be a, another time of blessing for you. We appreciate all of the wonderful responses that we've had so far to our online, Shabbat online. And uh, we're, we, we appreciate it very much. Well, we're going to continue. Again, we have with us today my daughter once again. Shoshana, who is going to share in word and song uh, something done her heart. And uh, as we enter into worship, let's bless his name together. Shabbat Shalom, Beth Zion. I'm so excited to be here worshiping with you another Saturday. I have something I'd like to share with you that the Lord laid on my heart this week. You might feel like you've fallen back into old ways. It's, it's a normal growth process to fall or to have setbacks. Pay attention to your emotions and where they lead you. You are still moving forward. The only way to get back is to keep moving forward and to keep going. And I know it's very easy for us to say, oh, if only I could get back to the way things were at this time in my life or the way things were at that time in my life. And the Lord is is showing us that the only way to get back is to keep moving forward. That what he has for us is better than what was in the past. Um, and so condemnation will typically try to come in, especially when we are moving forward, because condemnation is tied to self-worth. But the word of the Lord in Romans chapter 8 says that there is therefore now no condemnation for those in, who are in Messiah Yeshua. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Messiah Yeshua from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do, by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. The name of Yeshua is lifted Yeah. 
such a price but I Yes, there is power in the name of Yeshua to break every chain, to break every bondage, to break every sin. Whatever the challenge is, God's made provision for us in the name of Yeshua. Yeshua in Hebrew, Yeshua means salvation, and the name Yeshua means the Lord who saves or Hashem saves. And we are so grateful for God giving us that provision. Well, we're going to continue with another song uh, called Perfect Love Comes in a Name. And uh, in this world, these days, people are living in fear, living with uncertainty, wondering if there's any way to draw near to God. Well, God's made a provision. He said, perfect love casts out every fear. And so God makes that provision for us, the perfect love that comes through Yeshua, our Messiah. world full of hatred and fear Is there still hope that our hearts can draw near? Fear has torment And fear brings anguish and pain But perfect love can cast out all fear In a world gone completely insane and perfect love comes in a name We know that hate can turn to murder And words can either hurt us or heal But how we choose to treat one another Will determine if our love is real Or if our hearts are still filled with great fear Cause fear has torment and fear brings anger and rage But perfect love can cast out all fear In a world gone completely insane And perfect love comes in a name 
The name Yeshua means salvation. The name Yeshua can set us all free from all the things that afflict us and that try to steal our liberty. Yes, Yeshua can set us all free. Cause fear has torment And fear brings confusion and shame But perfect love can cast out all fear In a world gone completely insane Yes, and perfect love does have a name The name Yeshua means salvation The name Yeshua can make us whole he can bring us complete deliverance And can restore the enemy's soul Yes, Yeshua's love can make us all whole Oh yes, Yeshua needs salvation And Yeshua can set us all free So we can walk in a new way of living And know His love and really Yes, Yeshua can set us all free Oh, let His perfect love come set us all free Oh, yes, His perfect love can set us all free Yes, without question, His perfect love can set us all free. God really wants us to walk in a way a new way of living, to walk in a new place of freedom. We'll be talking about that more in the Torah portion and in the message today, the appointed time for freedom and second chances. We'll be talking about that later in our service. But uh, we're going to continue to worship the Lord with the traditional blessing of the Kaddish. If you'll join with me as we recite that now. Yitkadar vi yitkadar shemei rabba Bama devra kirute vi amlich mahute Bechayechon vi omechon Ubechayed kol bed Yisrael Pagala uvezman karib Vi yimeru amen Yehesh me rabba mevorach Kush bechata bene chemata dami on bealma. Ve meru amen. Ye heshla moraba min shamaya. Ve chayim olena ve alko yisrael. Ve meru amen. O se shalom bim romav. Hu ya se shalom aleinu ve ya kol Yisrael vimru vimru amen ya se shalom ya se shalom shalom aleinu ve ya kol Yisrael ya se shalom ya se shalom Shalom Aleinu V'yao Ko Yisrael Hey! Baruch Hashem. Well, we are going to recite now the Kaddish for Mourners in English with our full understanding. And with our full understanding, we do understand too that the Mourners Kaddish sometimes is confusing for people because you'll see it doesn't speak about death or loss but of magnifying and sanctifying the name of the Lord. No matter what circumstances we may be going through, we are called to worship and honor God, and He will work everything together for our good because we love Him and are called according to His purpose. And so we're going to recite this. We include the bracketed words, 
which are from an ancient Sephardic rabbinical custom corresponding to the word make a salvation to spring forth and bring near the Messiah. And he is the center of Judaism. He is the center of faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so it says to bring near the Messiah. God wants to come and make his presence known to us, to draw near and make his home in us. So as we recite this together, uh, if you're mourning the loss of a loved one, you can stand at this time, and uh, we will, and it says all, everybody join in. Magnified and sanctified be his great name in the world which he created according to his will. May he establish his kingdom and make a salvation to spring forth and bring near the Messiah in your lifetime and in your days and during the life of the whole house of Israel, speedily as soon and say, Amen. Let his great name be blessed forever and to all eternity. Blessed, praised, and glorified, exalted, extolled, and honored, magnified and lauded be the name of the Holy One. Blessed be he, though he be high above all the blessings and hymns, praises and consolations which are uttered in the world, and say, Amen. May there be abundant peace from heaven and life for us and for all Israel, and say, Amen. May he who makes peace in his high places make peace for us and for all Israel, and say, Amen. May the Lord comfort all those who mourn in Zion and Jerusalem. May your hand of peace and blessing be upon each one who has suffered loss. We do pray for loved ones, who are ill and ask you to raise them up, those who are being uh, under the influence of this virus, let them be healed and set free. And Lord, we ask you to bring your deliverance, whether it be for physical healing, financial, emotional, spiritual, relational. There are so many needs this day. We ask you to stretch forth your hand of power, send forth your creative word, and bring deliverance for every need represented. We thank you for your promise to Israel. You said to pray for the peace of Jerusalem that will prosper who love you. And so we pray for Jerusalem. We pray for the nation of Israel. And we pray that you would make even her enemies to be at peace with her. You have made this to be the focal point of history. And so, Lord, your plan must go forth. And we ask that you would help us to walk in union with your plan. Bring peace to the Middle East bring blessing and knowledge of the Lord to cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. We do pray for our nation here in the United States and ask you to watch over our leaders on the national, state, and local levels. Let them know that they are servant leaders, not those coming to lord it over anyone, but to serve and to be as servants. We ask you to give them wisdom and guidance, give them the ability to hear your voice and do what is right. We thank you, O God, that you are the one who watches over all of the first responders, the doctors, the nurses, and all those who who are working so hard to help and assist all those in need. We do pray for our military also to keep them safe and protected as they stand to protect us as well in our liberties and freedoms. We do pray and ask that you would bring your peace from on high your peace for us and for all Israel and for all nations, for all who call upon you, for all who call upon you in truth. In the name of our Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus, our Messiah, and everyone said, Amen. Well, we welcome you to Beth Zion, and uh, we say Shabbat Shalom once again. What would you say? Oh, I didn't hear that. Shabbat Shalom to you, yes. And uh, we are glad to have the opportunity to utilize all of this amazing technology to bring the message, to declare Messiah to the Jewish heart of Central Jersey, and to share the truth of Yeshua through Jewish eyes. You know, we mentioned before that Yeshua means salvation. Uh, In the church world, they refer to him as Jesus. But if you look up the name Jesus, he didn't hear that when he walked the earth. They didn't speak English back then. And it says that the origin of the name Jesus is a is from the English transliteration of the Greek transliteration of the name Yeshua, which means the Lord saves. And that's why it says also his name will be called Yeshua, 
because he will save his people from their sins. So there is something about that. We want to share the truth of Yeshua through Jewish eyes because if we don't understand the Jewish context in which Yeshua spoke his amazing words, we may lose sight of all that is represented there for us and all that he has purchased for us. And so when we put it back into that original Jewish context, it opens up not a focus just on Jewish things. Jewish things are fine. Greek things, Italian things, Spanish things. Every group has their things that are special. But there is something unique about the Jewish people and seeing the words of Yeshua through Jewish eyes because it brings clarity, it brings insight, it brings understanding. He makes the Torah come alive. He writes the Torah in our hearts and makes it alive. And it is not just information that we get to, get, to, to go to engage in, but truth. Yeshua said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And it's truth, real truth, that sets us free. Free from sin, free from all those things that would try to encumber us. And he's made that available, and we want to share. You'll see that when we talk about uh, Yeshua and look at him through the Torah portions and through the New Covenant, which, by the way, is also a Jewish book written by all Jewish people. Some people have thought maybe Luke wasn't Jewish, but he's a doctor, so he must have been Jewish. That's the joke we always say. But there is good reason to believe with the writings that he did and the reference he has to the inner circle of the, uh, of the temple, uh, there's very strong evidence to show that he was indeed Jewish. But that's a whole other story. We can go into that another time. Uh, we're just glad you're here and glad for the opportunity to, again, bring clarity. You know, he said he didn't come to abolish Torah, but to fulfill it, to bring it to its full meaning. And even within the Orthodox Jewish community, they talk about when Messiah comes, they say he will clarify Torah. Well, that's exactly what he did, and that's exactly what he does. He clarifies Torah. He makes it alive in us. He makes it rich and fills us with understanding so that we can be set free by the truth that is demonstrated in his life and in his teaching. And so we thank you for joining us here today. We have some uh, announcements to make, some short announcements. Uh, one thing I want to tell you is that uh, just yesterday, uh, Thursday night into Friday, uh, was what is called Pesach Sheni, uh, which is the second Passover. Uh, for those who missed the first Passover, and maybe even missed last night, I don't know, or the night before, uh, you can always go to our website and go through our Passover Seder with us. My wife and I did that this year, and uh, we've had wonderful response with that. Uh, it's sort of like a second chance. We'll be talking about that in the message as well. But uh, I thought it was also significant that uh, during Pesach Sheni, the second Passover, we also, uh, it was also the National Day of Prayer. And people from all different backgrounds, all different places, were praying and calling on God to bring deliverance for our nation and praying for the different elements that we are dealing with. Uh, and so I think it's significant, the message of sacrifice, the message of deliverance, the message of God moving by a mighty hand at Passover. It's so interesting that it coincides with this portion today, in fact, too. We'll be looking at that in a little while. Uh, we are now in the day 30 of the counting of the Omer, and on Tuesday, it's what's called Lagba Omer, the 33rd day of the counting of the Omer. And we're doing something special. It speaks of miraculous ending of a plague during the time of Rabbi Akiva and his Tamadim, his disciples. And I thought, gee, what a great time to be praying for God to bring an end to our plague, uh, the, the coronavirus. Uh, awesome. We also have uh, available for people with children, we have our uh, Kids Kosher Corner. You can go on our website. Uh, at the bottom, you can find a place to click on that, 
and it'll bring up some activities that you can work with your children on. Uh, and you don't have to have children. It's actually a really nice uh, teaching and uh, crafts and other things that adults can do as well. But um, take a look at that. I know my wife and also working with others has really put a lot into those things. So take advantage of it and let us know what you think. If you would like to make a donation to Beth Zion, you can click on the donation button that is on our website. Uh, that would be with PayPal and credit card and debit cards. You can also mail your check to Beth Zion, P.O. Box 807, Jackson, New Jersey, 08527. Also, if you have any prayer requests, you can click on that at our website and let us know of your prayer requests. And our intercessory prayer people will remember those needs in prayer as well. Keep praying for us and thank you for your support in prayer and in your financial giving as well. Uh, we have been really blessed by the response that so many have expressed during this time as we've been venturing out into these new areas of online service. Uh, also, you can um, go to the contact and feedback. We always love hearing from you. And uh, so if you would like to give us some feedback and uh, you can uh, give us your contact information and all of that, we'll be glad to keep you posted about upcoming events and all of that as well. Well, this brings us to the Torah portion of our service. If you have your Bibles, turn to Vayikra, Leviticus chapter 23. And we will begin with the blessings. Baruch Hu Ad Adonai HaMavorach Baruch Adonai HaMavorach Le'olam Va'ed Baruch Adonai HaMavorach Le'olam Va'ed Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Bochar Bonim Mikol Hamim V'natan Lanu Et Toroto Baruch Atah Adonai Noten HaTorah Amen You grant blessings, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who has chosen us from all peoples, and has given us your Torah. You grant blessings, O Lord, giver of the Torah. From Vayakra, Leviticus chapter 23, beginning in verse 4. These are the designated times of Hashem, the holy convocations you are to proclaim at their designated times. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, between sundown and complete darkness, comes Pesach, Passover. For Hashem. On the fifteenth day of the same month is the festival of matzah. For seven days you are to eat matzah. On the first day you are to have a holy convocation. Don't do any kind of ordinary work. Bring an offering made by fire to the Lord for seven days. On the seventh day is a holy convocation. Do not do any kind of ordinary work. Verse 9. Hashem said to Moshe, Tell the people of Israel, after you enter the land I am giving you and harvest its ripe crops, you are to bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the Kohen. He is to wave the sheaf before Hashem so that you will be accepted. The Kohen is to wave it on the day after Shabbat. On the day that you wave the sheaf, you are to offer a male lamb without defect in the first year as a burnt offering for the Lord. It goes on to talk about the 50 days of the counting of the Omer. Baruch Hataronai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Asher Natan Lana Torah Temet Mechaye Olam Nata Betochenu Baruch Hataronai Notain Hatorah Amen. You grant blessings, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe who has given us the Torah of truth and has thus provided us with the way of everlasting life, you grant blessings, O Lord, giver of the Torah. If you turn to the Brit Hadashah, the New Covenant, uh, we're going to go to the letter of Galatians, chapter 4, and we will begin with verse 3. So it is with us, when we were children, we were slaves to the elemental spirits of the universe. 
But when the appointed time arrived, God sent forth his son. He was born from a woman, born into a culture in which legalistic perversion of Torah was the norm, so that he might redeem those in subjection to this legalism and thus enable us to be made God's sons. Now because you are sons, God has sent forth into our hearts the spirit of his son, the spirit who cries, Abba, that is, dear father. So through God, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if you are a son, you are also an heir. In the past, when you did not know God, you served as slaves, beings which in reality are non-gods. But now you do know God, and more than that, you are known by God. So how is it that you turn back again to those weak and miserable elemental spirits? Do you want to enslave yourself to them once again? Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Natan Lana Mashiach Yeshua V'Advarim Shela Berda Chadasha Baruch Adonai Noten HaBerda Chadasha Amen. You grant blessings, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who has given us Messiah Yeshua and the words of the renewed covenant. You grant blessings, O Lord, giver of the renewed covenant. Avinu Malkeinu, our Father and our King, we thank you for the reading of these portions and the other passages that we will look at. We ask you to open up our hearts now as we look into your word. Speak deeply to us. Make your word alive in us and transform us by the power of your Ruach through your word. We give you thanks in Yeshua's name. Amen. All right, today's portion is called Amor, which means speak. And it says that the Lord said to Moses to speak to the sons of Aaron. And in doing that, it says in verse 1 of chapter 21 of Vayakra, Leviticus, it says, speak to the Kohanim, the sons of Aaron. And he goes into a whole number of things. But in verse 4, he said, he may not make himself unclean because he is a leader among his people. Doing so would profane him. And then verse 8 says, Rather, you are to set him apart as holy, because he offers the bread of your God. He is to be holy for you, because I, the Lord, who makes you holy, am holy. When we look at last week's portion, it was Acharaimot and Kedoshim. It was a double portion. And in that section, in chapter 18, he made the statement, he said, Speak to the people of Israel. Tell them, I am the Lord your God. You are not to engage in the activities found in the land of Egypt where you used to live. And you are not to engage in the activities found in the land of Canaan, where I am bringing you, nor are you to live by their laws. You are to observe my laws and rulings. If a person does them, he will have life through them. I am the Lord. And in this section, uh, we find that he makes it very clear that it's important to be able to not be caught up with all of the activities that go on in the nation, either from Egypt or in the new land, the people who were in the land. He warns them. Uh, what we saw in last week's portion is that he spoke of the range from the most vile to the most holy, Kedoshim, holy people. We saw that as he went through this, he mentioned about Moloch, uh, the fire god that they would offer their children to, and it was a very horrible thing. He said in chapter 19, verse 1 through 4, uh, he said, Speak to the entire community of Israel. Tell them, you people are to be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Every one of you is to revere his father and mother, and you are to keep Shabbat. I am the Lord your God. Do not turn to idols and do not cast metal gods for yourselves. I am Hashem, your God. And when we look at this, 
he makes it very clear. He goes into all of the vile things that the people had done in the land. And he says to them that he would vomit them out of the land. In fact, what it says actually okay. uh, in uh, chapter 18, verse 24 yeah, he said, Do not make yourselves unclean by any of these things, because all the nations which I am expelling ahead of you are defiled with them. The land has become unclean, and this is why I am punishing it. The land itself will vomit out its inhabitants, but you are to keep my laws and rulings and not engage in any of these disgusting practices, neither the citizen nor the foreigner living with you. What's interesting is it doesn't say that God was going to spew them out of the land or vomit them out of the land. It said that the land, it says, if you make the land unclean, it, the land, will vomit you out of it, just as it vo is vomiting out the nations that were there before you. He makes it very clear that we are supposed to, um, that we are supposed to uh, care for the uh, foreigner. He said in uh, chapter 19, verse... verse 33, if a foreigner stays with you in your land, do not do him wrong. Rather, treat the foreigner staying with you like the native born among you. You are to love him as yourself, for you were foreigners in the land of Egypt. I am Hashem, your God. He makes it clear that people were welcome to be a part of the nation, but he also makes it clear that they were not to defile themselves, that they were taking on the responsibilities of the nation. And he's saying, don't follow the vile things, the sexual activities that were there, the places where people were involved in all kinds of immoral things. Idol worship was the end result of this, uh, distancing themselves from God instead of drawing near to him. And so when we look at this, uh, he is telling them that they have to listen to the things that God has said, what he's laid out for us. He said, don't follow idols, don't follow these things because they will corrupt you and corrupt the land and the land itself will vomit you out of the land. Now, I don't want to make this sound negative, because it's not negative. The title for this message is The Appointed Time for Freedom and Second Chances. You know, just this past week, um, on Thursday, was uh, Pesach Shani, which is the second Passover. And it is actually taken from the portion uh, from Numbers, uh, chapter 9, where it says a year, the first, a year after they were out of the land, uh, they were celebrating Pesach, they were celebrating Passover, and some were unclean and were unable to do it because someone's corpse or something that happened. And uh, it says, Moshe answered, wait so that I can hear from the Lord. Uh, they'll consider, con to consider what he's going to say. And what he did was he set up something very unusual. No other holiday has this option. But he said that if you missed it, <laughs> Passover, he said that a month later you can have what is called Pesach Shani, the second Passover. And what it says here, uh, let's see, there were certain people who were unclean and they couldn't do this. And they ask, and so in verse 9 it says, Hashem said to Moshe, tell the people of Israel, if any of you now or in the future generations is unclean because of a corpse or if he is on a trip abroad, nevertheless, he is to observe Pesach. But he will observe it in the second month on the 14th day at dusk. They are to eat it with matzah and moror. They are to leave none of it until morning, and they are not to break any of its bones. They are to observe it according to all the regulations of Pesach. And then it says this, verse 14, If a foreigner is staying with you and wants to observe Pesach for Hashem, he is to do it according to the regulations and rules of Pesach. You are to have the same law for the foreigner as for the citizen. You know, in our country, people talk about everybody having rights to do whatever they want to do. That 
People coming in can do whatever they want. But again, we are not Israel, but the concept for this in the Torah for Israel was that foreigners could be a part of Israel even as the native born. But they also had the responsibility to follow in the things that God was teaching them, to follow in the moral code that he laid out and to walk in relationship with him. And so all of these things are important because, because God wanted to establish the nation as a people living in the presence of God. God wants to, as it says so many times, he said he wants to dwell among them, to walk in their midst, that he would be their God and they would be his people. He says, be holy for I am holy. And he tells them that this is so important, important for the Kohanim, for the priests, important for the people to be able to stay true to the things that God has said. Now, oftentimes, this second Pesach is referred to, as I mentioned before, Pesach Sheni, which is the second Passover or the second sacrifice. And what is also significant about it is that it is the holiday of second chances. People get to redo this, and Passover is the most messianic of all the holidays. This is traditionally understood. It also is uh, speaking so much of the redemptive hand of God. As I mentioned before, it speaks of resurrection. The passage I read earlier in Vayikra in Leviticus uh, chapter 23, where it's going through the holidays, it actually is spelling out, during Seder, we talk about Eit Omer Reshit Katser, which is Leviticus uh, chapter 23, verse 10. Uh, it talks about this, uh, the fact that there would be a first fruit. It says, tell the people of Israel, after you enter the land I am giving you and harvest its fruit, uh, it's ripe crops, you are to bring a sheaf of the first fruit of your harvest to the Kohenim. What this is saying, first fruit there is not um, Yom HaPikarim, that refers to Shavuot or Pentecost. But it starts off with the first fruit just a couple days after the Passover was celebrated. And so the idea of, we've mentioned before, of resurrection is very strongly a part of Passover. The death of of the Lamb, the death of Messiah, the resurrection of the Jewish people, the resurrection of Messiah, and the fact that we go through this over and over again. And it's interesting that, the, that as I mentioned, Thursday was Pesach Sheni, the second Passover. And this is important because uh, it's in the portion this week and I mention it because uh, there's, there's so many things we can look at. Uh, for instance, um, uh, they asked why should they be deprived? Uh, and then uh, any person who is contaminated by death or is on a distant road. Uh, there was a question that was asked, um, what does it mean a distant road or contaminated by death? Uh, one of the things it says is when you do what you need to do to change, I will change the rules. In some ways, God made a provision for those who were unable to meet the challenge, but their heart was to do and obey the things that God said, and God made a provision. He made a provision for them, and uh, let's see, there's some deeper points here. I, I read this where it said, a state of, con of disconnection from God is a type of death. Disconnection from God is a type of death, and a distant road is a place where we are far away from where we really are supposed to be. This is something most of us can identify with. And it is, again, speaking of the fact that we have distanced ourselves from God. And as a result, we are missing the mark. But these appointed times that are mentioned, the Moedim, the designated times of Hashem, these represent the way that God deals with his people. And so he is giving us during this season a reminder of the fact that he wants to bring freedom and he wants to bring 
a second chance. A second chance is oh so important. Um, we can lose touch with what God is saying. And God gives us the ability to be able to experience that unbelievable gift from God, his redemptive power. Uh, it says, uh, there was a question, it said, how do we know when we are far away from our homestead, when we are wandering and cut off? A sense of disconnection is a place where we have lost touch with our essential self. I mean, that sounds a little bit psychological here. But basically, we lose touch. We disconnect uh, and we bypass our unconscious live with un uh, with unconscious living. It's sort of like going into cruise control. Um, we do things by rote and we stop processing or allowing these things to be processed in our lives. And God wants to reconnect us. He wants to reconnect us. And one of the things that we see is this idea of making shuva, tishuva, returning to the Lord, the power of return. And the wonderful thing is that God is always there, ready to make available the transformation of our lives as we return to Him. Well, I want to go quickly through some of this because I want to get to some other parts. When we when we look at the um, at the passage in Galatians, he also spoke of the appointed times. This is also the designated times. But he talks about a designated time where everything that the Torah spoke of would be fulfilled in a person, in Messiah. And so he says, uh, he says in and the conflict between the elemental spirits of the universe and the Spirit of God is so important for us to grasp and take hold of. Look at what he says in Galatians 4, verse 4. He says, But when the appointed time, verse 3, So it is with us, when we were children, we were slaves to the elemental spirits of the universe. But when the appointed time arrived, God sent forth his Son, Yeshua, who was born from a woman, born into a culture in which the legalistic perversion of the Torah was the norm, so that he might redeem those in subjection to this legalism and thus enable us to be made God's sons. And then he says, Now because you are sons, God has sent forth into our hearts the spirit of his Son, the spirit who cries out, Abba, that is, Dear Father, so through God, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if you are a son, you are also an heir. And then he says in verse 8 this, and it identifies not just with our Jewish people, the things that can separate us from God, but with the Gentile world, with others as well, the things in this world, the people in the land, the lifestyles that are here, that are corrupt and cause the land itself to spew people out of it, to walk out of sync, to go distancing ourselves from God. He says, in the past, when you did not know God, you served as slaves, beings which in reality are non-gods. These are idols. These are things. And it's not just a stone that you worship or a piece of wood. It can be our own way of doing things. It can be our own ideas of what we think is right calling it our rights and um, the way that we choose to do it. But with it, it says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And what God is trying to point out with all of these references to the sexual immorality, to even to the issues of homosexuality and all of the other things that are listed in that portion, he ties them into idolatry because they all have a way of pulling ourselves away from God, distancing ourselves from Him by drawing near to other things that suck the very life out of us. And so God wants to say in all of that, not to point out how bad everything is, but to point out that there is a Pesach Shini, a second Passover, a second chance to experience the redemptive hand of God. There is always available to us the opportunity for God to 
bring us back to himself. He says, Shuva Yisrael, Adonai Lehecha Keshato Bavanecha, Kechui Machem Devarim. Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for you have fallen by your iniquities. Take with you words and return. And what does it say? That if we return to God, He will return to us. He will bring about transformation in our lives. This is what He wants to do. He wants to bring healing and deliverance for us. He wants to bring us back, to remove us from being enslaved and cause us to be able to be set free. And then He says this, In the past, when you did not know God, you served as slaves, beings, which in reality are non-gods. You say, well, I don't want to serve. I don't serve an idol. No, you know what? When we are controlled, not controlled by God and allowing Him to have preeminence in our life, we become subject to other things that become our slave master. In reality, they're non-gods. But they are the things that we find ourselves giving attention, affection, and worship to. It says, but now you do, but now you do know God. And more than that, you are known by God. So how is it, he questions them, how is it that you turn back again to those weak and miserable elemental spirits? Do you want to enslave yourself to them once again? He's telling us that if these people, these Galatians, who had experienced the redemptive hand of God that took them away out of this lifestyle of idolatry and of enslavement to their passions and to these things that are destructive in their life, how then are they now going back and recreating a submission to those things that they were once free from? It's a good question because all of us are subject to the old nature trying to draw us back into those, those places. Uh, when we look at Yohanan, John, he says this. There was a place where they heard him speaking, and it says in John 8, 30, many people who heard him say these things trusted in him. So Yeshua said to the Judeans who had trusted him, if you obey what I say, then you are really my Talmudim. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered, We are the seed of Abraham, and have never been slaves to anyone. So what do you mean by saying, You will be set free? Yeshua answered them, Yes, indeed, I tell you that everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Now a slave does not remain with a family forever, but a son does remain with it forever. So if the Son sets you free, you will be really free. You'll be free indeed. God came to set us free. Messiah came to set us free from all of these things that hold us bound. And sometimes the things that become idols are not, again, wood and stone and things of that nature. Sometimes the way that we choose to interpret Torah, the way we choose to pick and choose what we want to do or how we want to live can cause us to come into a new kind of bondage, a bondage of hypocrisy, a bondage of a place where we are losing sight of what's important in our lives. But God wants to set us free. That's why Yeshua came, to set at liberty those that are bound. It says in Luke 24, when Yeshua was, again, during this time of the counting of the Omer. We are in that period now. And this was the time after his resurrection, when he was seen by the people on the road to Emmaus in chapter 24 of Luke. And uh, they were talking with him, and they didn't realize that it was him. Uh, as they were discussing these things with him, uh, in verse uh, 25, he then breaks into this whole thing. I'm not going to go into all the story. I spoke about this a few weeks ago. He said to them, foolish people, so unwilling to put your trust in everything the prophet spoke. Didn't the Messiah have to die like this before entering his glory? Then starting with Moshe, Moses, and all the prophets, he explained to them the things that can be found throughout the Tanakh, the Hebrew Scriptures, concerning himself. And it says that 
when he broke bread and he gave the bracha, they suddenly recognized that this was him. And they said, in verse 32, they said to each other, didn't our hearts burn inside of us as he spoke to us on the road, opening up the Tanakh, the Hebrew Scriptures, to us? And they went and they returned. And, and then Yeshua said uh, in verse 44, in verse 44, uh, in verse 44, Yeshua said, this is what I meant when I was still with you and told you that everything written about me in the Torah of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms had to be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the Tanakh, showing them once again the suffering of Messiah, rising from the dead on the third day. These are also in keeping with the Passover, which is in the portion that we're reading about and also the time of resurrection, the first fruit among merry brethren. Uh, he says to them in verse 46, telling them, here is what it says, the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day. And in his name, repentance leading to forgiveness of sin is to be proclaimed to people from all nations, starting with Yerushalayim. You are witnesses of these things. Now I am sending forth upon you what my father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been equipped with power from above. And he led them off and he was ascended into the heavens. And then verse 52, it says, they bowed in worship to him, then returned to Yerushalayim, overflowing with joy. And they spent all their time in the temple courts praising God. This is important because it was during this period that he, of the 40 days it was during this period of the 50 days that we are in now that Yeshua is explaining in those first 40 days to his disciples going through the Torah going through the Navim and the Ketuvim the prophets and the writings and explaining to them and showing them the types and shadows that were seen all throughout the scripture that were fulfilled in Messiah coming here to the earth, to live, to teach, to die, and to be raised from the dead, and then to raise us to newness of life. It is the ultimate second chance, freedom from those things that keep us bound, and the opportunity for God to bring us into a new place, a new dimension of life in Him. And he then sends them out. He's going to send them out. We should be doing the same thing. We should be going through these portions every day. We should be looking at the teachings of Messiah every day and allow ourselves to be prepared to let our hearts burn within us with the passion and the presence of God making his word alive in us. Yeshua wants to make his home in us. You know, in Acts 1, he also said this, Again, very similarly, um, similarly because Luke wrote Luke and wrote Acts. So he goes forth and says this. You know, just, just as one little sidebar, I've mentioned this before, but it's, it's one of my uh, special points, and that is that the last verse, the very last verse, two verses of Luke 24, last of that book itself, it says, they bowed in worship to him, then returned to Jerusalem, overflowing with joy. Sometimes we get this idea that they were hiding from the Romans, they were hiding from the Jewish authorities. They were, they were not. They were so empowered by spending time in the Word and spending time with Yeshua that they then went back to spend the next 10 days going over and over again the things that they had learned. And it says, and they spent all their time in the temple courts praising God. Every day they were in the temple talking about these things, praying and worshiping and praising God. And then we find in Acts 1, it says, After his death, he showed himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. During a period of 40 days, they saw him, and he spoke with them about the kingdom of God. At, that, at one of these gatherings, he instructed them not to leave Jerusalem but to wait for what the Father promised, which you heard about from me. For Yochanan used to immerse people in water, but in a few days you will be immersed with the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. When they were together, they asked him, 
And this is kind of interesting because they still were going back to an old way. Lord, are you at this time going to restore self-rule in Israel? Are you going to remove the Romans? Are you going to get us set free? He answered, you don't need to know the dates or the times. The Father has kept these under his own authority. But you will receive power when the Ruach HaKodesh comes upon you. You will be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, indeed to the ends of the earth. What he was pointing out was not to always know the times, not to always know all the details, but to be empowered by God's Spirit, to allow His Word to become alive in us. After the death, after His death, He showed Himself alive. What happens when we are walking in death and God brings His resurrection life? He brings His refreshing. He brings that second chance, freedom, the appointed times. At the appointed time, God sent forth His Son into the world. At the appointed times, the festivals, the holidays, all speak of different aspects of how God dealt with His people and how He pointed in type and shadow to what Messiah would come and do and make available to us the opportunity for second chances, to be set free, to experience freedom and second chances. God has made this available. You know, even with even with uh, this time of Lagba Omer, it talks about how uh, during the time of Rabbi Akiba, when he was supporting Bar Kokhba as Messiah, uh, it talks about that uh, this whole idea of Lagba Omer, uh, really with bonfires and you, you see people getting their hair cut, you can't seem to get your hair cut now, right now, you have to kind of cut your hair yourself these days. But uh, aside from that, they were in the midst of a plague, it says. Now, they were rebelling against Rome, and they had some good opportunities. For three years, they had self-rule uh, during that time. And then uh, the Romans came down and crushed them, uh, and that was the end of it. And so, uh, but Bar Kokhba uh, was there, and it says that during this time that there was... Um, it tells us that during this season, a plague killed thousands of Rabbi Akiva students because they did not treat one another respectfully. Interesting that we talked a while back about uh, Sararat, uh, leprosy, and how the connection between how we treat one another um, and the words that we use, how they affect us. And so he said that there was a plague, and the plague ceased on the 33rd day of the counting of the Omer. Maybe at this time, we can be praying. Uh, Tuesday is Lagba Omer. We should be praying for God to remove the plague that our country and that the world seems to be under right now. And there are other plagues as well, too. There is tyranny. There are other things that are going on. And we need to be set free. God wants to set us free. I want you to know that as we pray and as we seek the face of God, God wants to bring deliverance. He wants to bring restoration. He wants to return, to turn our exile and restore us. This is what he wants. Some people will say, well, you know, he's harping on all of these things which are my lifestyle and I want to do it. Yeah, but you know what? It isn't so much that he's talking about those things as the cause of problem as it is the result of distancing ourselves from God. Oh. They take on a life of their own and they become a slave master to us. God wants to set us free and into a place of richness in Him. He wants us to be able to know what it is. When the sun sets us free, we shall be free indeed. You know, I love the fact that uh, my daughter had mentioned earlier from, uh, she had closed her little talk with Romans 8 and think about this here again along these same lines it says therefore there is no longer any condemnation awaiting those who are in union with the Messiah Yeshua why because the Torah of the Spirit which produces this life in union with Messiah Yeshua has set me free from the Torah of sin and death this Torah of the Spirit in union with Messiah, sets us free 
from sin and death. The Torah could not do by itself these things because it lacked the power to make the old nature cooperate. God did it by sending his own son as a human being with a nature like ours, but without sin. God did this in order to deal with sin, and in so doing, he executed the punishment against sin in human nature, so that the just requirement of the Torah might be fulfilled in us, who do not run our lives according to what our old nature wants, but according to what the Spirit wants. For those who identify with their old nature set their minds on the things of the old nature, but those who identify with the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Having one's mind controlled by the old nature is death. That's what it is. Spewed out of the land, by the land. Nature itself understands these things are contrary to nature, and they vomit them out of the land. But having one's mind controlled by the Spirit is life and shalom. God wants us to be able to experience His shalom, His peace. He wants us to be able to experience what it is to be free from being controlled by our old nature. To come back and experience the freedom and the second chance to walk in union with Messiah. As we walk in union with Him, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. No longer any condemnation because we walk in union with Messiah, led and directed by His Ruach, by His Spirit, not conforming to the old nature, but our minds controlled by the Spirit, which produces life and peace. God wants to set the captives free. This is His desire. This is His heart for you. As you yield yourself to Him, He will open up those opportunities, not just going through all of the motions of tradition. Traditions are wonderful. But traditions can also become idols in another fashion. They can become the focal point that allows us to lose connection with God, to lose connection with Messiah. And in doing that, we end up going astray, distancing ourselves from Him. When God says, draw near to God and He will draw near to you, resist the adversary and He will flee from you. You don't resist the adversary, Hasatan, by saying, get away from me, get away from me, get away from me. Or, I'm trying really hard and I can't seem to break free. No, no, the way that we resist the adversary is to draw near to God because he says if we draw near to God God will draw near to us and when he draws near to us there is no vacancy there is no opening there is no room in the inn the adversary has no welcome and no place within our lives because we are allowing God's spirit to fill every place with himself and going back to the very thing that he says from the beginning throughout the Torah, I will walk in the midst of you, I will be your God, and you will be my people. This is the promise God has made, and this is the gift that God has provided for us. I just want to find one passage. Where did I put that? Ah, here it is. I have it over here. I want to mention just a few verses in closing. And that is this. He says, In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. That's what Yeshua said. You have tribulation, you have troubles, you have trials, you have situations that are out of control. Be of good cheer. What? Be of good cheer because I'm out of control, things are not working out? No, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And he says, Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. And as such, he will make available to us the ability for us to overcome as well. And that was in John, Yohanan, uh, chapter 16, verse 33. But look at what he says in Matthew eleven twenty-eight: 28. Come to me, all you who are labored and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. 
And what does he say at the end of Matthew after he's gone into the heavens and after he spent time with them and as he prepared them for the great commission to go forth into all the world and preach the good news? It's good news. He said, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. God with us is a majority. No matter what comes against us, He is there for you, He is there for us, and He wants us to experience His blessing in every way. Avinu Malkainu, our Father, our King, we thank you for this time in your word. We ask you to allow us to walk in liberty, to walk in freedom. The appointed times for our freedom and the second chances are available to us. Help us to walk in that liberty and in that freedom, empowered by your spirit, quickened by your word, made alive in us. Write your Torah, your instruction in our hearts and help us to walk in a manner that is pleasing to you, living in relationship with you, in union with you. Thank you, Father. You've removed the condemnation and you've given us hope and a heritage that you will not take away. Thank you for sending Messiah to be our bread of life and to bring us into the fullness of your redemption. Everything that your scriptures spoke of is fulfilled in him. And we thank you, Father. In Yeshua's name. Amen. I'm going to close with the ironic benediction. And I want you to know that we're here for you. If you have any questions or if you would like to pray with us, contact us. Be in touch, even if we can't be in touch. <laughs> but uh, join us because God has so much more that he wants to do in your life if you'll just yield yourself to him. As Aaron blessed the people of Israel, so we bless one another with these words. Beyosem lecho shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. B'shem sar shalom, in the name of our Prince of Peace, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. And everyone said, Amen. Thank you so much. I just want to mention one thing. I, I realized this as I was praying. Uh, something Shoshana said earlier, which I thought was kind of interesting in light of what we spoke about now in the message. She said that not to fall back into our old ways. Interesting. The only way to get back is by keep moving forward. Keep reaching out to the Lord and let him make known to you all of the abundance that he wants to pour out in your life. It's worth it. You can be set free. Shabbat Shalom. We'll see you next week.